By the grace of God, my sobriety date's April 9th of 1981. Um, and I appreciate you guys giving God that nice hand because it's, it's not Don Major that's kept me sober for 35 years. It's a loving God and you guys. And as much or more than anything, the 12 steps that are our program of recovery, the only program of recovery we've got. But at any rate, uh, I grew up on a tobacco farm in southwestern Kentucky, down on the Tennessee-Kentucky line. And uh, probably the most informative thing I can tell you about my early life uh, is that it wasn't a thing like I thought it was, just absolutely no resemblance. My, my capacity for self-delusion is astounding. <laughs> And if I haven't done the work I need to do today, and I'm talking about Saturday, because if I've learned anything around here, I've learned that I don't get a whole lot of divine intervention on Saturday based on what I did on Friday. It's a one-day-at-a-time thing. <coughs> and if I haven't done what I need to do on Saturday, <coughs> that capacity for self-delusion is 100% intact. <clears throat> and I was 37 when I got sober, which makes me really old now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> before I got sober, I would have passed any lie detector test on earth. When I told you the really interesting and romantic saga, it was made way past a mere story about my early struggles and my subsequent rise to power. <laughs> and... Of course, it was all about how by my iron will and my sterling intellect, I had pulled myself up by the bootstraps from the depths of poverty to those staggering heights I'd reached in life. And I believed that crap so sincerely, I would usually have you and me both crying before I was halfway done telling it. <laughs> and I honestly don't think I was sober a full week before I realized what a load of malarkey. We weren't even poor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't anywhere close to poor. We were middle-class farming people that had everything we needed and most of the things we wanted. And those staggering heights I thought I'd reach were a good deal more staggering than they were high. Uh, my alcoholism is a many splendid thing. I, I, I stumble across a new facet or part of it every day or two, and uh, sure I will as long as I stay sober and I'm alive. And and one thing it is, is something that my high school English teacher would have called a disease of superlatives. And what that means is that without divine intervention, I won't think in terms of things like good or bad. And ordinary will never cross my mind. I'll go to the extremes of best, worst, the extremes of everything. And I'll give you a warning, well, we lawyers call it a caveat. But whatever you call it, I, I'll tell you that <coughs> both drunk and sober, I've always been a whole lot more ordinary than my ego's ever been comfortable with. But uh, <coughs> what was really going on the first 12 or 13 years of my life didn't have anything to do with all that crap I thought was going on. What was going on is, is an ego disorder that I've had all my life. Uh, the book tells us that selfishness and self-centeredness are the root of our troubles. And what this meant to me for decades is that the first thing wrong with me, before anything else, the first thing wrong with me is I've got a disorder of my ego. <clears throat> and on account of that disorder of my ego, without divine intervention, and by the way, if any of you are intellectually offended by some old fool up here going on about divine intervention, not only do I understand you in my old seat, uh, <laughs> but I have a suggestion for you. When I say divine intervention, just substitute the magic from the steps and it'll get you to the same place and won't offend your sensitive intellect so terribly. But... <laughs> But at any rate, on a, without divine intervention, 
All my life I have been, and without divine intervention, I remain so obsessed with myself, <clears throat> so obsessed with how I believe I stack up against other people in the world. I'm so obsessed with how I feel that I've been convinced for a long time that my alcoholism boils down to the absolute bedrock, the ego disorder, and one sentence. And that sentence is this. Without divine intervention, I will always wind up letting how I feel be the most important thing in the world. Now, without divine intervention, I can give some lip service to something being more important than how I feel. And I might be able to act for just a little while like something's more important, but if I haven't done what I need to do on Saturday, when the chips get down, I'll go back to my default position. And my default position is to let how I feel be the most important thing in the universe. And all that obsession with myself in creating that pain and emptiness inside me, which I kind of think is probably the only effect that that, that degree of self-centeredness and self-obsession can have on a, on a human being is to create that pain and that emptiness and that apartness, that differentness. <clears throat> Without divine intervention, I can't be okay with anything or anybody. That ego disorder of mine has dominated my entire life, and some of the things it's done are a little amusing. It's always made me an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And what I mean by that is I've always been perfectly capable of feeling too good for something or somebody and at the same instant knowing I'm not nearly good enough for that same person or that same thing. <coughs> Without divine intervention, I can't be on your level and okay with you or anything or anybody on this earth. I can be above you. I can be below you. And insanely, I can be both at the same time. But I can't be your peer. I can't be just okay with you. <clears throat> and that's basically the mess that I brought to my first drunk. What was really going on that first 12 or 13 years was a totally self-absorbed kid trying to stay a half step ahead of a screaming fit with, by the way, spotty success on that. But... <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> at, at any rate, um, that first night that I got drunk, I was either 12 or 13 years old. And that night I got in an awful lot of trouble, and I puked, and I blacked out, and I passed out. And I woke up the next morning and swore all those Baptists around there were right. <laughs> and that I would never, ever touch that stuff again. And not only was I sincere, it was actually fairly effective because it was nearly a week until I got drunk the second time. <laughs> and the way things were going to go for the next 25 years, that was a miracle. Uh, <coughs> and <coughs> I got drunk that second time for the exact same reason I got drunk the other several thousand times. After all that trouble and all that pain, here I was drunk again in less than a week. And the reason now is very clear to me. It's because the magic had happened. Now, at the time, I didn't know the magic had happened. All I knew was that on my way to puking and so on, I had passed through a right pleasant neighborhood. But, <coughs> but looking back on it, of course the magic had happened. Because the way I feel is the most important thing in the universe. And for the first time in my life, I had found something that made me feel good enough inside that I could stand it without either trying to stuff something in there and or run as hard as I could to run away with it. I was okay. And I was okay with you. I was okay with it all. And since the way I feel is the most important thing in the world, and since for the next 25 years I didn't know that Anything other than the alcohol and the things like it could do that trick for me. The bottom line was really simple. It didn't matter what it cost. And it didn't matter who it cost. Because the way I feel is the most important thing in the universe. I'm not going to give you a drunk log, 
But I'll tell you that from that first drunk, I truly was off and running. Um, a kid who drank and acted the way I did in today's world would have a net thrown over his butt and in an asylum before his 14th birthday. But in Trigg County, Kentucky, uh, in the 1950s, if you were cute enough and smart enough, and if you had the right last name, you could get away with murder. And I practically did. <coughs> and uh, school was easy for me. And by the time I was getting done with my junior year of high school, and I was 16, uh, <coughs> I remember Angie talking about starting a lot of things when she was 16. Well. On one hand, I was still holding on to everything by my fingertips, but it was just about to crumble. And I knew why it was about to crumble. You know, I could feel the bricks fall in there once in a while, one hitting me on the shoulder, uh, and I knew that it was crumbling on account of my drinking. So it was time to get out of Dodge. And on the other hand, I had the egomania part <coughs> of it assuring me that that tobacco patch couldn't hold something as hot as I was anyway. So I got on a Greyhound bus by myself, and I went 200 miles up to Louisville, the big city there, James. And I kicked around for a few days, and I wound up on the doorstep of the University of Louisville. And they gave me a whole bunch of tests and let me in as an early admission student with an academic scholarship. And my reaction to that was to stay so drunk the first semester that I just lost all concept of day and night. It was just a matter of passing out and coming to. And, of course, I blew the scholarship. And then for the next seven and a half years, I worked full-time, full, drank full-time, went to school full-time, and somehow finished undergraduate in law school. And I haven't got a clue how that happened. When I look back on that whole eight years, I don't have a handful of really crisp, clear memories. It's all just a swirling gray mass of alcoholic insanity. Spring of 1968, I graduated from law school and my daughter Dana was born. And Dana was my only child for over 20 years. I, I have a 27-year-old son now, and Dana's 48. You know, when your children are middle age, you're out of excuses. You're just old. <laughs> But at any rate, I started practicing law in downtown Louisville in 68, and I practiced for about 10 years <clears throat> with a good deal of material success. Uh, not nearly as much as I used to think I'd had. The first several years I was sober, I had been nearly Clarence Darrow during those 10 years. But uh, a phenomenon about staying sober longer is we get a different focus on our past. In fact, I have... Sandy Beach used to say, uh, "Don't tell me I can't. You can't change the past. I do it all the time." Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> the most objective I can be today is is I, I was always pretty materially successful. I've always been <clears throat> primarily a criminal defense lawyer. And I've always had a knack for getting a hold of some cases. Sometimes it had money and, and sometimes publicity in them. And that's what I would stick in your face when you suggested that something was wrong with somebody who was living as insanely as I was. And I told you how crazy it was leading up to that. Well, it escalated. It escalated because alcoholism just simply progresses in everybody that ever had it. And in my case, it escalated because I had some money to escalate it with, and I didn't have a boss anymore. I didn't have anybody looking over my shoulder. <clears throat> and during that 10 years, uh, just as an example on it, I'm absolutely convinced that at least a third of the nights I didn't take off my clothes and try to go to bed like a normal human being. I either passed out in some situation other than that, or in the latter years of that 10 years, I changed the, <clears throat> the combination of things I was putting in my body to just try to fly through the day without ever laid, having laid my head down. Uh, <clears throat> and during that 10 years, I began to use a world of things other than booze. And I used a world of them. But now, before you get your singleness of uh, <coughs> purpose, knickers, all in a knot, uh, <laughs> let let me explain that in my circumstances, as far as I'm concerned, I'm exactly like Bill and Dr. Bob. Read it if you don't believe it. Uh, everything 
was a side show except the booze. The booze was the big tent for me. Everything else was something to somehow change the effect of the booze, maybe increase the effect, maybe decrease the effect, maybe try to help me function on the hangovers. But it all went back to the booze. <coughs> February 10th, 1978. I got full <coughs> of several outside issues, plus scotch and vodka. And I drove a Corvette um, off the Penny Rowell Parkway on the Kentucky-Tennessee line at uh, 120 or so miles an hour. Since the roads were icy, it was probably not real good judgment to be driving at 120. Uh, and it did an awful lot of bad things to my body. It, it crushed both knees. I lost the main ar- a part of the main artery in one lower leg, and they had to do a bypass in the upper leg and take it in uh, vein to... Uh, to uh, replace that artery, and it separated my pelvis and pulled my <coughs> internal plumbing in two, so I didn't have a urinary function for over a year. I had a suprapubic catheter, they call it, where they bore a hole in your abdomen, pop that in a uh, plastic tube into your bladder uh, to uh, through your abdomen to carry your urine to a bag. I was in the hospital for more than six months, or in hospitals for more than six months out of that first year after the wreck, and I had a half dozen major surgeries. Uh, the doctors told me early on that I would never walk again without at least a brace on one of my legs. And they told me that they were very sure that no surgeon would ever attempt to try to find the mess inside me and reconnect my plumbing so that I would ever have a urinary function. As it turns out, they were wrong. Thank God. And let me assure you, it didn't have anything to do with me following directions. Because, <laughs> because I've had a, a sad history with the directions. Uh, they have never applied to me. They have never, never meant what they say. Uh, my case has always been different. Uh, and if you knew, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, <coughs> and... <laughs> and <laughs> See, I've always known who makes the directions. It's square johns, just buttoned down conservative square johns. And they'd usually be advised by insurance lawyers who are worse than they are. And, and I understand the target audience of the directions. It's morons, absolute morons. So obviously everything is overstated in order to manipulate morons into doing things. And in my special case, it's always been necessary to sort of extrapolate, I guess, to to figure out what the directions really mean, because they certainly don't mean what they say. (coughs) And I assure you, right today, on Saturday, if I haven't done what I need to do to get my divine intervention, and I look at something that says, do not exceed six in 24 hours, my brain will actually register that as something like, do not exceed 36 in 24 hours. But at any rate, <clears throat> back to the hospitals after the wreck, uh, and uh, uh, I haven't, uh, I, I've been, I haven't owned a brace or a cane for 36 years, longer than I've been sober. And about a year after that wreck, the head of urology over at Duke University did, did put my plumbing back together to restore my urinary function, but I didn't know that was going to happen. I, all I knew was the prognosis that I had. Well, they did. Oh, by the way, when I got to Vanderbilt, uh, it was took about an hour and a half. They took me to Vanderbilt in Nashville rather than back to Louisville because I was much closer to Nashville. And I guess it was about an hour and a half, and I still had, still had a blood alcohol of over 0. .40, in addition to all those other things I had in my body, and I was not in a blackout. I remember every minute leading up to that wreck. I remember being thrown out and hitting the ground. I remember every minute going through the transport to the hospital, and they were, uh, I woke up two or three times during the emergency surgery because they were terrified to give me enough anesthesia to keep me under on account of all the stuff I had in my body. <coughs> but uh, at any rate, they didn't know who I was at Vanderbilt, and, and they didn't treat me with nearly the appropriate deference. <laughs> right? And <coughs> as... <coughs> um, as soon as I got out of the re- 
operating room, the recovery room, and intensive care long enough to get myself moved against medical advice back to Louisville by ambulance. I did. And I got back to the Louisville hospitals, and I laid in those hospitals for <coughs> for uh, for months. And after I got back there, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, in fact, uh, I sponsor a couple of the guys that I'm about to talk about now. Uh, uh, most of them are either dead or doing long-term uh, time in the penitentiary. None of us are about there doing what we were doing uh, now. But after I got back to Louisville, those friends would come in every single day and bring me booze and more dope than the doctors were giving me. And I would lay in that hospital bed and say really intelligent things. <laughs> I would say things like, you know, fellas, anybody can stop drinking when the going gets a little tough. But it takes a man to lay in there with it when the bills start coming in. And then I would explain to him that a man ought not be out there doing the crime if he wasn't prepared to do the time. So just because we'd hit a bump in the road, they weren't going to me, hear me whining. Give me another drink and let's go on with it. That is insanity. And that is powerlessness. And when you really think about it, it is absolutely letting the way I feel in that instant be the most important thing in the world. Letting the way I felt in that instant be more important than my child, more important than my profession, more important than whether I ever walked, more important than whether I ever peed, more important than whether I lived or died. Letting how I feel in that moment be the most important thing in the universe. I had a young lady with me when I had that wreck, and <clears throat> she was not my daughter's mother, and at the time I was remarried to my daughter's mother. Now, uh, I'm going to make a sociological observation. Please feel free to ignore it. It's not in the big book, um, and it'd be my only sociological observation of the evening, but... <clears throat> Over the last 35 years, I've just kind of looked around and noticed, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that the fact that I was remarried to the same woman probably establishes my alcoholism without further authentication. Uh, I just don't believe a normie would do that. I, I, I think if they even considered jumping right back in a frying pan that they just got out of, they'd tear the door off the asylum getting in to protect themselves. And, and we do it routinely, drunk and sober. You know, old Joe and Sue divorced, but they're dating. They'll probably get back together. And it works for us sometimes. It's not necessarily bad. It's just really different from ordinary folks. But... At any rate, end of sociological observation. <clears throat> and by the way, I've had to make an awful lot of amends on account of that area of my life. And I'm not proud of the people that I hurt along the way. But I'm not going to fail to laugh at myself where I've been ridiculous either. As you can imagine, I got a brand new divorce right after the wreck. Uh, and I wound up married during that period, the uh, first year after the wreck, to, to the young lady who was with me. She had on a seat belt, so she was not hurt nearly as badly as I am. She hurt badly, but not as badly as I am. <clears throat> and about a year after that wreck, I made my first trip to the asylum. And I don't use that word to be cutesy. Uh, Bill Wilson uses it in the big book, and my mama used it. Uh, when, I, when I was a kid, people didn't have uh, alcohol and substance abuse problems and go to treatment nor did they have breakdowns and go to the hospital. They went crazy and were put in asylums. And that's a whole lot more descriptive of what kept happening to me, I assure you. And by the time I made that first one, around the first year of 1979, I, I still had the tube in my belly, my catheter bag, and the braces on both legs and my crutches, and the phenomenon of craving that the, big, the doctor's opinion talks about. And that's nothing in the world but the physical addiction to ethyl alcohol, which coupled with, coupled with that terrible mental obsession puts us in the box we're in. But <coughs> it had progressed in me. Now, I had it the first drink I ever took. But for over 20 years, the fear of what would happen, nobody ever had to tell me that drinking in the morning would cure a hangover. I was born knowing that in the marrow of my bones. But... For 20 years, the terror, it wasn't fear, it was terror, 
the terror that if I did go ahead and start drinking around the clock, that you would see what I was and I'd have to face what I was was so great that the fear would outweigh that craving for just a little bit, for 20 years. But then that switched, and it became the most powerful thing I've ever felt in my life. Both drunk and sober, I've had 12 or 14 major surgeries. Timmy back there has been attended on a couple, three of them. Uh, but uh, none of those surgeries have hurt me nearly as much as each one of the last couple of hundred times I had to come off ethyl alcohol. Most addictive, most destructive thing I ever put in my body. And by that time, I had physically lost the ability, physically lost the ability to stop drinking once I started. Something had to intervene and prize me loose from alcohol. And when it did, it took three or four days for me to be physically able to do something like sit up in a chair. Well, they got me through the three or four days in that first asylum. They set me up in a chair and, for some strange reason, had an AA meeting. And I know now that they got around to reading step three, and what I heard was some sort of absolute malarkey about turning my will and life over to some mythical god crap thing they were talking about. And you can imagine how that insulted my intellect. So I climbed up on my crutches and straightened up my catheter bag and, and, and said as loud as I could, do you mean to tell me there are people in this world who believe such crap? And then for you young folks, we didn't have cell phones, so I hobbled on over to the payphone and called somebody to get me away from those religious fanatics before they polluted my pristine intellect. Well, that was sometime around the first year of 1979, <clears throat> and I wound up getting sober almost two and a half years later in April of 81. And I don't remember a lot of things that happened during that period, but some things that I do know happened during that period, most of them pieced together, are that I went back to the asylum, some form of hospitalization on account of my, my, my drinking and drugging, 17 more times in that uh, two and a half years. I became addicted to hard narcotics, street, and I'm so grateful for that. Because that brought enough pressure on my law partners to kick me out of the law firm that another guy and I had founded. And I proved that I wasn't going to make the decision at his bottom. And if you knew, please don't buy the idea that bottom happens to us. I don't believe bottom happens to us. Because if it happens to us, we don't have a choice. We're just poor little dry leaves floating on the wind, and if we get blown to bottom while we get to get sober and do the steps and have wonderful friends and make money and have sex and everything, it's just wonderful. <laughs> but on the other hand, if we happen to catch a downdraft and we can't get can't, or updraft and can't get blown to bottom, well, we just got to die a mad dog death. And my God, God didn't set the universe up that way. Uh, I believe that bottom is a decision over which we've got all the control on earth. I've seen an awful lot of folks die waiting for bottom to happen. But at any rate, I wasn't going to make that decision as long as I had a Timex watch. I certainly wasn't going to do it as long as I had a law firm. And right after the guys kicked me out of the firm, the state of Kentucky jerked my law license. <coughs> oh, uh, the young lady that I had married had had to leave me on account of my insanity, and during that period, she was staying with some girlfriends and died in an accident. I last laid eyes on Dana, my only child, in January of 1980, and I didn't see or talk to Dana for over three years. Uh, <clears throat> the Internal Revenue took my portion of the office building that my partners and I had built in downtown Louisville and a couple of things like that. Uh, the mortgage companies took the homes the ex-wives were in, and it was just all gone. And for almost a year, up until the fall of 1980, which is six months before I got sober, uh, for almost a year I lived without an address. Now, I'm not claiming that I slept regularly under the bridge. I didn't. I was always able to con somebody into taking me in. And very frequently it was strangers, very frequently. But I didn't have an address. I didn't have a home to go to for nearly a year before the fall of 80. Fall of 80, I washed up on the doorstep of Asylum Number 17, the next to last one. 
or next to, I hope next to last one. But, and I, that was back in Nashville, Tennessee, where they didn't know who I was. Uh, and um, they told me later, the folks at that, uh, at that treatment center, it actually was, um, the, they told me later they only let me in because they didn't think I'd live another week if they left me on the street. Uh, I had no home, I had no car, had no clothes, my teeth were rotting out of my head. I wouldn't have opened a piece of mail from Louisville for $50,000 and I didn't have two cents, but my terror of it was so great <coughs> that I wouldn't. Uh, I stayed in there about a month and it was time they had to boot me out. Had time to go. I had no place to go. I had no way to get there. And I had a roommate there that was a really young guy. Now, I was ancient. I guess I was 35 or 6, but uh, Matt was 21, and his parents lived there in Nashville. And those sweet, sweet spiritual folks weren't even really involved in AA. But they felt sorry for me and said, Don, why don't you come stay with us a few days? Let's try to figure out what to do with you. And I went and lived with them a year. Uh, and, and let me say something about spiritual folks that are not in AA. You know, it's it's really uh, it's surprising news to me sometimes, but we alcoholics do not have a monopoly on spirituality. Uh, this beautiful red-headed lady over here that I've been blessed with being married to for 25 years wakes up more spiritual than I can get after two hours of prayer, meditation, and intensive work with another alcoholic. And yet sometimes I have to bite my tongue to keep from saying, well, sweetie, what do you know about spirituality? You're not even an alcoholic, for God's sake. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth, and I don't want to insult anybody, but it's what I believe. I believe in late 1934 and 1935, God took pity on a bunch of spiritual retardees. <laughs> and put the wonderful spirituality that folks had been enjoying for millennia in such a simple form that even we could latch on to it and get a little bit of spirituality. But at any rate, the, the first six months I lived with those sweet folks, <clears throat> up until April 9th, 81, I didn't stay straight, but it got better. Uh, <clears throat> and I had to get better. Uh, I, I, I didn't regain the ability to use a knife and fork on food anywhere near properly for two or three months after I got sober. I, mean, I was truly a basket case. Uh, and during that six months, uh, I went to a world of AA meetings, most of them at the 202 Club in Nashville, Tennessee. I got to where sometimes I could go as long as two or three weeks without getting ripped. And that was a world record for me since the first time I got drunk, in or out of the asylum. I was a master at getting ripped in the asylum. But how I really know I got better is that in that entire six-month period, they only put me back in the asylum once. And the rate I'd been going twice a year in the asylum looked like the picture of mental health. And <clears throat> late March of 81, I got on my most recent drunk. And it was another one of my pop-off vodka slash Listerine drunks. And I truly have drunk a barrel of both those things. And, and, and this is not a joke. I have better memories of the Listerine than I do of that old hot pop-off. I can stand to smell Listerine today, but I can't stand to smell the old hot pop-off. But, but on this most recent drunk, I was drinking and taking everything I could get my hands on. <clears throat> and by the time... April the 8th rolled around, the most recent day I drank. I'd been drunk 10 days or two weeks. And I was uh, sitting on the edge of a bed in a motel in Nashville, and a loving God that I didn't know was there, that I didn't want anything to do with it was there, that I didn't think could have anything to do with my life, gave me the most beautiful gift I've ever had or will ever have, gave me the gift of being able to follow directions about how to run my life, voluntarily, even though I did not understand them, I did not agree with them, I did not think they would work, and I certainly did not want to do it. And you see, at 37 years old when I got sober, I don't believe I'd ever truly done a single mature act 
I don't think I had ever one time in that 37 years voluntarily did something that somebody else suggested about my life. If I didn't want to do it, if I didn't agree with it, if I didn't think it worked, I wouldn't, I'd then never done it once. And I think those were the first mature acts. That and accepting that powerless over alcohol does not mean powerless over my elbow. Angie made a statement today that's near and dear to my heart, a little different words, but it's the same statement. Uh, I've got a loving God that will do almost anything for me, but that I've found will do almost nothing for me without my cooperation, just absolutely almost nothing. And as long as I insisted that AA make me feel like not wanting to drink and make me not want to drink too bad, maybe, uh, after all, I was a poor little alcoholic, powerless over alcohol, so here we go. But I had to accept that I can't abdicate the responsibility for what I got and put in my body. God won't knock a drink out of my hand. You folks can't. Sharon can't. You know, all the medical people in the world can't. I cannot abdicate the responsibility for what I put in my body. And I would never have lived to stay sober two or three months if I hadn't have gotten that message and if I hadn't been willing to act on it. But at any rate, in April of 81, I didn't know I had any gifts. Nothing had changed. My mind hadn't changed about anything. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I, the three or four days after that last drunk, when I was able to stumble, I stumbled back to the door of the 202 Club in Nashville. I didn't think they would let me in, and in today's world, they would not have let me in. I had passed out in their AA meetings and had to be bodily carried out. They had caught me in their men's rooms with outside issues. Uh, they, they had warned people they sponsored to stay away from me, that I was a loser and I was going to die. About two months before I got sober, a big old boy about 6'5", Joe Wall, he's been dead several years, walked up to me and looked way down at me and said, Don, I'm beginning to think you really are too intelligent for this program. And I thought he was giving me a compliment. <laughs> I swear to God, my knee-jerk reaction was, well, thank God they finally figured out who they're dealing with here. <laughs> but Joe went on, and I'm so grateful he did. And he said, you know, we've never had anybody too dumb for this deal, and we bury you buttholes all time. And that felt like an icy hand closing over something inside me. And it was still there two months later. I went ahead and drank the, the another two months. But it was still there when I stumbled back to the door of the 202 Club. And they did let me in. Much to my surprise, I remember what was said and who said it. They said, come on in, Don. You are keeping us sober. And I, and I said, will you, will, will you tell me one more time what I need to do if I want to live? And they said, sure. Don't drink. Don't take dope and go to meetings. By the grace of God, the first 60 days, I went to over 150 meetings. To the best of my memory, I didn't want to go to one of them. I certainly didn't want to go to one of them for any kind of valid reason. Uh, <coughs> and it was still clear to me that you all were religious fanatics. My brain was still assuring me that what we needed to do was get our head out of the sand, get our butt back to Louisville, get some money, get a law license, big car, good-looking woman, be somebody for God's sake. But I'd been given that beautiful gift that I didn't know I had of being able to turn around to my brain and say, yeah, no, partner, but you and I have nearly killed one another. And we don't have anything left to do but go to these dumb old meetings that can't possibly take care of the unique and complex problems that are Don Major. Okay? And leading up to getting sober, you see, my alcoholism is an absolute stone sociopath. My alcoholism is the perfect sociopath. It only had one reason for existing, and that's to try to get itself that next drink. And it will tell me anything on the face of this earth in order to get it. It'll tell me something that will kill me, you, both of us. It'll tell me totally inconsistent lies back to back with one another, just sling them all up against the wall, hoping some of them will stick. Now, i got a real problem because another facet of my many splendored alcoholism is that disorder of my perception. Now, that's a nice clinical-sounding term. But, you know, when you think about that, all the world that means is I don't see things right. 
I don't hear them right. I don't always recognize them for what they are. So without divine intervention, without the magic from these steps, I'll wind up believing one of those deadly lies, and I'll pick up that drink, and I'll start that god-awful phenomenal craving, and I'll die of the mad dog death that I missed so narrowly in 1981. But <clears throat> at any rate... Uh, you see, I thought in order for AA to work, that first, I had to believe it would work. And second, it had to feel like it was working. And I think I also thought I had to be able to see the causal relationship between A causing B. It turned out that none of that had anything to do with it. All I needed to do was get my raggedy butt to meeting after meeting, and let my old sick brain and soul get dragged in there kicking and screaming behind my raggedy butt. And then they tell, <clears throat> because you see, I had the same thing backwards, that without divine intervention, I have had backwards every day of my life, and I still do. What I have backwards is that I make it all about what I think, feel, and believe. I make that the center of my universe. In nature, it does not occur to me, if I don't feel like doing right, to go ahead and do right anyway. What occurs to me is something like, John, I don't feel like going to work. I reckon I've been talking to my sponsor and praying about it. I reckon I ought to do an inventory on that or maybe go to some more meetings or get some outside counseling maybe. Because <clears throat> you see, I think something's got to fix me to make me feel like doing right before I do right. All my life, I thought the difference between good people and me was they felt like doing right. And if we could just get me fixed so I felt like doing right, I'd be good people too. I know now they may not have felt a bit more like doing right than I did. They just did right. And that made them good people. And I didn't. And regardless of what kind of good intentions or what was going on in the rationalizations I had in my mind, <clears throat> that made me bad people. What I think, feel, and believe has never one time gone in the record. All the people that were hurt, including me, in my alcoholism, all the things that were destroyed, my thoughts, feelings, and believings didn't destroy a bit of it, not one bit. They were destroyed by what I did and what I failed to do. Those thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that I want to make the center of the universe, they're like will-o'-the-wisp. They don't have any real form. They're just amorphous, and they, they, they just float around. They change with the, with the breeze, and yet I want to make them the center of the universe. <clears throat> but when I got it straight on the meetings, I understood that it was the action. It wasn't what I thought, felt, and believed. You see, if I wait until I think, feel, and believe the things that make me want to do right, I will never, ever do right. In order to ever think, feel, and believe right, I've got to go ahead and start acting before I feel like it. And that works that way for me every single time. You know, the, on our daily reprieve from alcoholism, thank God <laughs> the book doesn't say that our daily reprieve is contingent on our spiritual condition. First two or three years I was sober, I was sworn it did. But thank God what it says is our daily reprieve is contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And folks, that's the difference in the lights being on in this room and turning off. Because I don't have any immediate control over my spiritual condition. <clears throat> if my daily reprieve was contingent on my spiritual condition, i got to tell you, I still wake up some mornings when the best I can tell my spiritual condition is El Crapo. <laughs> you know, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want to get down there and pray. I'm sure it won't do any good if I do. And if that were true on those days, I'd be absolutely helpless. I could get struck drunk and there'd be nothing I'd do about it. But the maintenance of my spiritual condition is a set of actions over which I have 100% control. 
And I found that I can wake up feeling like that, but I didn't make myself get down on my knees. Say those words, even if I can't remember the last one, I just pray it because I'm so obsessed about something I'm afraid of or whatever, but I can go ahead and do it. Cherry Carpenter, gave me, who was my original sponsor in Nashville, <coughs> gave me a, 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 an earful on that one time. I started acting as if on the praying, and lo and behold, I was coming to believe. And I was really disturbed. Because a lot of mornings it didn't seem like my prayers could possibly be working. I, you know, I was so obsessed with something, and like I say, sometimes couldn't remember the last word. I just tried to pray, and it was really clear to me that the words were just bouncing off the walls and ceiling. And I took that to Cherry, and he said, "Don, your ego is going to kill you yet." He said, "Let's examine that." He said, "Are you under the impression that God is not aware of your needs unless you clearly delineate them?" He said, um, maybe you you believe your God is so lacking in power that he or she is somewhere wringing their hands and saying, oh, I so hope Don stumbles across the right words. I hope he says the magic words. I want to do it, but I can't do it unless he says it just right. And Terry went on and said, Don, in your case, I think it may be worse than that. He said, in your case, I think you may think you'll state it so eloquently you will sway God into doing something. He said, you dummy, the only thing that's of any value, whatever, is your willingness to humble yourself before your Creator and say please and thank you. He explained, as so many folks did to me in Nashville, this deal is not about learning. This deal is not about, <coughs> it's not about psychology. You know, I found out that if I approach prayer, the steps, any part of my recovery, in any way as an intellectual or psychological process, it doesn't work any better than all the other intellectual and psychological approaches have worked on alcoholism. In other words, zip, nada, zero. The deal's based on me following directions like a little child and the grace of God resulting from the following of the directions. And that's exactly the way it's worked with me. But at any rate, I don't know how I took that left turn there, but I did. <laughs> They also told me when I'd stumbled back into the clubhouse that if I wanted to live, I'd have to read the big book. I said, I've read it several times. They said, we know you've been quoting it to us while you've been dying. <laughs> and they said, the first thing you need to get straight is this is not a philosophy book. There's nothing in that book that you can learn or master that's going to transport you to a sublime state of sobriety. What this book is, is a simple instruction manual for your actions. And they said, if you want to live, you'll come back to this book like a little child and start at the front cover and go through it line for line, reading only the black part, not, <coughs> not, not distinguishing, memorizing, or arguing with anything, not looking for anything to learn, but looking for what it says do. And if you want to live and if you'll do that, it'll work. That was when they explained to me that the steps are the prescription for alcoholism. They work on alcoholism exactly like penicillin works on an infection. If I have an infection that's going to kill me if it's not treated, but will respond to penicillin, <coughs> I don't need to understand the origin, width, breadth, and nature of my infection. And I don't need to aggravate the medical profession and the people around me whining about that. I don't need to understand one single thing about how penicillin works in the human body. I don't need to believe that that little bottle of pills can take care of all these terrible things wrong with wonderful me. And here's the real kicker. I don't need to want to take the pills. That's irrelevant. <laughs> if I take the pills as directed, I will get just fine. Thank you. And they assured me that these steps would work on my alcoholism exactly that way. And by the grace of God, they have. And I've been so blessed to see it work that way in the lives of hundreds of other alcoholics. And then they told me if I want to live, I was going to have to get on my knees every morning and every night and ask and thank a power greater than myself. And tears came to my eyes, rolling down my cheeks. I remember exactly where I was sitting, looking up the steps on the wall. 
And I, I explained to him that I couldn't do that because the part of me that wanted to live, which wasn't a very big part, but there was a part that wanted to live, had known for two or three years that if I was going to live, I was going to have to get what you guys had. And I thought in order to do that, I had to somehow change what I thought, felt, and believed to make it more like it looked like to me you thought, felt, and believed. And I had tried every way I knew. And I couldn't change a hair. So I'm sitting there explaining to them I can't do the praying because the second step's killing me. And I finally heard them when they said, and I'm sure they'd said it a hundred times, but I, I didn't hear it. <clears throat> when they said, oh, Don, you've got that backwards too. We have never suggested that you think, feel, or believe anything. And my mouth probably fell open because I think that's the whole ball game, you know, what I think, feel, and believe. They said, well, no, we wouldn't do that. said, in the first place, <clears throat> you are far too ill to have any valid thoughts, feelings, or beliefs. <laughs> and they said, in the second place, the issue of whether you live or die will be determined solely by what you do. What you think, feel, or believe won't have one thing to do with it. So they said, if you want to live, you better get down on your knees and start saying those words. <laughs> and don't pay any attention to the old crazy picture show in the back of your head. Having no idea when they said that, I did not intend to do it because I knew they were all wet. But a few days later, later in April, I found myself. So I had that gift I didn't know I had, you know. I had that gift of being able to follow directions that I didn't want to follow, didn't understand, didn't agree with, didn't think would work. And in the latter part of April of 81, I found myself embarrassed because even though I was by myself, getting on my knees and, as far as I was concerned, talking to a wall, but saying those words. And the miracle of the second step began to happen. And I began to come to believe. And if I had waited until I intellectually believed the second step, till I intellectually believed there was some sort of metaphysical power that could take care of the humanly hopeless dilemma that we all admit that we're in if we've done step one properly. If I'd waited until I intellectually believed there was a power to do that, I would have been rotting in a pauper's grave for over 35 years. It turned out that when I was willing to act like a person would act, if they did believe that, it worked just fine. Worked absolutely fine. <clears throat> I lived in Nashville 21 months after I got sober, unemployed, unemployable, happier than I'd ever been in my life. <clears throat> they led me through the first nine steps. I did four and five, formed a picture of what a spiritual dawn ought to look like. And then I went back to my attic. By that time, I'd moved out from the family. I was living in an attic. And I went back to my attic, and I followed directions. I got the book. I didn't have a shelf, but I put it up and acted like I was getting it down off the shelf. And I opened up the book, and I reviewed the first five steps, making sure I hadn't scrimped on anything. I spent exactly one hour doing it. Decided I was okay. So, you know, the big book gives us not quite a half a page on 6 and 7, on the top of page 76. So, looked like to me I was fine. So I said the seventh step prayer and was convinced that that was the point where, with God's help, I went to work on me to make me into what I had decided a spiritual don ought to be. Well, at about a year and a half sober, as a byproduct of steps eight and nine, pure byproduct, much to my surprise, my law license got put back in order. I had brought the bar into terrible disrepute. When I lost my license, it wasn't a matter of Whatever happened to Don Major was on the front page of the paper in Louisville, what happened to Don Major. Uh, <coughs> and I didn't think the bar would ever forgive me. And I've got to tell you, folks, the forgiveness that non-alcoholics have for us when we finally start trying to do the right thing passes all understanding. It's not even fair. We get treated better than the poor schmuck that never fouled up just kept showing up every day doing what they were supposed to do. We truly are the prodigal children. But at any rate, my law license got put back in order, and <clears throat> if I could have found a minimum wage job in Nashville, I would never have gone back to Louisville. I was terrified. Still don't think that was paranoia. I still believe that a loving God poured oil on the troubled waters of my past to keep the worst of what I, I feared from happening. But January of 83, I went back to Louisville, uh, scared to death, Started trying to practice law again. 
Um, February of 83 is the second month. Um, Don Pritz, who a lot of you all knew and I came to know and love Don, uh, was supposed to be the Sunday morning speaker at the Kentucky State Convention. Uh, and Don got snowed in at an airport out west. The Saturday morning speaker, I've never been to a AA conference in my life. Saturday morning speaker kept going and going, even longer than I'm going here. But I, I, <coughs> if any of y'all get ready, go ahead and leave. I'll leave when I'm ready, okay? Uh, <coughs> if y'all get done, you know, go ahead. <laughs> but uh, at, at any rate, I had to go different. And I said, I squirmed and I squirmed. Finally, after about an hour and a half, I, I, I've got to go. So I went out to go to the bathroom, and the host committee was, was huddling out there trying to figure out what to do about the Sunday morning speaker. And one of them pointed at me and said, I heard him over at Hubbard's Lane the other night. Let's put him up there. So <clears throat> 22 months sober, they stuck me up in front of 2,000 people. And, and I thought that was terrible. You know, my judgment of events in my life is terrible. It's not just off, it's usually 180 degrees off. If I think it's the worst thing that ever happened, it has no redeeming quality to it whatsoever. If I manage not to drink, try to put that next step in front of one foot in front of the other, listen to that little divine spark that will tell me where only to take that next stitch. Those things will wind up being the basis of the most beautiful things in my life. On the other hand, if when I see it coming over the horizon, I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, it's probably getting ready to try to kill me. So I need to lay off the judgment of events in my life. That wound up being a beautiful thing. People started saying nice things. <clears throat> Don, will you do this in AA? Will you be my sponsor? Will you travel here to talk? And uh, all those great things. So that started happening, and that was great. That same month, February of 83, I wound up seeing Dana for the first time in over three years, and my daughter. And two months later, she moved in with me and lived with me throughout her high school years, and we are dear friends today. It's been a beautiful, beautiful relationship. Uh, <clears throat> and the first nine years of my sobriety were truly just, they were magic. They were enchanted. But the first nine years of my sobriety, relationships with the object sex and financial chaos like to have killed me. They like to have beat me to death. And <clears throat> I was working so hard on it. I truly was. I, I had good objectives, not bad objectives. And whatever character defect was embarrassing me, was inconsistent with my little idea of what a spiritual dawn ought to be, was making me uncomfortable, I would grab that thing by the collar. And I would use prayer, steps, meetings, sponsors, Outside counseling, I'd slam that character defect up against the wall and say, Come here, God, give me a little help, and we'll get rid of it. And God never came. And I had no idea what was wrong. Words are really important to me in sobriety because I've learned, and <coughs> Damon and, and Dana mentioned something very similar this day. What I name something or call something or somebody, uh, or somebody is going to have more than any other single thing to do with what the reality of that thing or person is to me. And the word realize is one of my favorites. You know, I always thought that to know and to realize were just basically the same thing. You know, I know that or I realize that. Realize is a form of the word real. When I have realized it, that literally means it has become real inside me. There's all sorts of stuff I've known for 30 years that have not come into reality inside me. And I could have quoted the seventh step prayer backwards, but I didn't realize that it really means what it says. It doesn't ask God to remove all my defects of character. It certainly does not ask God to remove the ones that are making me uncomfortable and are inconsistent with this little self-determined objective that I had dressed up in spiritual clothing and claimed and named it not a self-determined objective. <clears throat> you know, the book says in the 11th step that the praying for our own selfish sins doesn't work. You can easily see why. Many of us have wasted a lot of time. Well, it took me nine years to understand that me praying for a character defect to be gone because I want it gone is the same as me praying for a bright red Ferrari. The exact same thing. Because what the seventh step prayer says, 
<clears throat> is asking God to remove every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to God and my fellows. And that's not limited to the seventh step. It's throughout the steps. It's the heart of our program. Third step prayer, take away my difficulties. Not so I can be sober and spiritual and happy. Take away my difficulties. That victory over them will bear witness to those I would help of God's love, power, and way of life. Eighth and ninth step, really practical, all about putting our lives in order, right? Yeah. But if you look on page 77, it says, yeah, we're doing that, but it's not our real purpose. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves, to be of maximum service to God and those around us. Folks, I have an illness that is self-centeredness. That's what it is. I cannot effectively treat it by more obsession on self. It doesn't make any difference how I dress up that obsession on self. And I've got an entire wardrobe for it. <laughs> I've got responsibility clothing. You know, I, <coughs> I've got psychological clothing. I, I've got spiritual clothing. But it doesn't change the nature of it. It's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. My AA hero, Chuck Chamberlain, said it best. I don't need to worry about taking care of me. When I worry about taking care of me, try to outthink, outperform, and outmaneuver, I wind up in the snake pit every single time. If I try to help God's kids do what they need to have done for fun and for free because I want to, God will never fail to take care of me. And it's worked exactly that way for me, just exactly that way. God's a much better lawyer than I am. <clears throat> when I go down to that office and try to win cases, look good, make money, cover my butt, wind up in that snake pit every time. But when I go down there and try to help God's kids, it all works really, really well. You know, a great spiritual paradox for me has wound up being that if any part of me is trying to get you to love, comfort, and understand me, which includes giving me my rights, uh, if any part of me is trying to get you to love, comfort, and understand me, it seems it is an absolute spiritual law that I will not be loved, comforted, and understood to my satisfaction. It can't happen. If I let my comfort depend on that and you do exactly what I thought I wanted you to do before you're done, I'll change it. It can't happen. The only time it's possible for me to feel loved, comforted, and understood to my satisfaction is when I beat those 11th step prayers to death, what I call the other 98% of the 11th step. You know, the 2% are morning and are night. The other 98% is the rest of the day where the book tells us absolutely every day, all day, we humbly say to ourselves many times that I will be done and we constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show because we're constantly trying to run it, obviously. But, and I add to that from the prayer of St. Francis, to pray to love, comfort, and understand rather than to be loved, comforted, and understood. And when I run those prayers through my head until the miracle happens, and for just a minute, you are more important to me than I am. For just a minute, I am truly listening to you. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say or how it's going to sound. I'm not thinking about three or four other tracks, you know, running here. You truly have, like Chuck says, I've given my interest, attention, and love to you. And you have indeed become, for that moment, the most interesting thing on earth. And i become a listener, something I'm not by nature. <clears throat> and that miracle happens. I wind up loved, comforted, and understood to beyond my wildest dreams. Of course, when I like that and try to grab it and hold on to it, poof, poof, i got to start over. It's gone again. But that's the way it works for me. What it turned out, six and seven, and something happened in May of 1990. I must sit down in just a couple of minutes, but I want to tell you this, and then I will. In May of 1990, when I was nine years sober, <clears throat> something happened that caused me to look at step six and seven in an entirely different way. I realized what 6 and 7 are really about. It's not where I go to work on me with God's help. It's where I give up on working on me. It's where I accept that I can't effectively work on any of my character defects any more effectively than I was able to work on alcoholism. It's where I lay myself at my God's feet and say, Mom, Dad, I don't know where we are or how we got here. I certainly don't know where we're supposed to go. But I'm going to act like a person would act because I'm not saintly enough to feel this way most of the time. 
I'm going to act like a person would act if they really were not concerned with where you were taking them. If they really understood and accepted that they can't comprehend the patterns of their life. You know, I'm 72 and haven't comprehended a single pattern right. Yet I want to waste time trying to figure them out. And the only glimpse of God's will I have ever gotten is in the absolute right now. You know, we believe it'll be God's will from now five seconds from now for me to be going on. You'd be squirming a bit. The fact is, in uh, uh, the the fact is, in the next five seconds, any one of us could have a heart attack or seizure or or stroke. Uh, the electricity could go off. The sprinkler system could come on. A wet drunk could come barging in here, disrupting everything. Uh, police could come in here looking for one of us that hadn't completed our amends. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, all sorts of things could happen in the next five seconds that would totally change what I believe God's will is going to be five seconds from now. And yet I want to waste time on what God's will is for next Tuesday and ten years from now. I've got less chance of understanding the patterns in my life than a chimpanzee does of mastering quantum physics. My job is stitching. My job is not the patterns. My job is to listen for that spark of the divine that's in all of us. And if I'll get my mind cleared out, it's mainly fear, greed, lust, and things like that a little bit of the time. But 99% of the time is fear. It's fear I won't get something I want or that I'll lose something I don't want to live. Or worst of all, for most of us, I'll look bad. Uh, <coughs> and if, if I'll listen for that spark of the divine, and I'll take that stitch where the spark tells me. God will take me where I need to go. Now, I've been stumbling that way for 26 years. And six and seven have been the most important steps in my life for 26 years. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to tell you, I've done it so poorly, so poorly, that I don't think there's been a single day when if you'd asked me, Don, have you done six and seven well enough that it'll do any good, that I would have said, yeah, I think I might have made it today. Every day I said, no, man, I got knocked over by self-will 50 or 100 times. And, and I had to get up and dust myself off and say, Mom, Dad, I fouled up again. Excuse me. Stumble another couple of steps in the right direction. Get knocked down in the same process over and over and over. And I thought every time that happened, that was an interruption of my spiritual growth. Turned out that process is the only spiritual growth of which I'm capable. And my God is just tickled to death with it. My God doesn't require perfection. My God's tickled to death with persistence. Just keeping on trying to stumble toward that right thing. <clears throat> if God had given me, or if I had made a list when I was uh, nine years sober, of the best I thought I could have in every area of my life, and God has said, I'm sick of your wine, and I'm giving you exactly what you asked for. Please believe this, because it's not dramatization. It's truth. I would have shortchanged myself in every single area of my life. Every single area. My, <laughs> my married life, my beautiful Sharon, she and I never argue. I sponsor some guys that are psychologists and counselors. They tell me that's unhealthy. I, I tell them that they're welcome to their healthy relationships. I'm just going to wallow in my illness, thanks. Uh, and by the way, if you caught me arguing with anybody for the last 25 or so years, somebody was paying me. I will not argue with you for nothing to make my belly hurt. Because I've been relieved of that awful need to be right. Right is part of that will of the wisp in my head. It's just as amorphous changes. But at any rate... I've had the wonderful deal of being married to my Sharon. That bar association that I so embarrassed has honored me until it's embarrassing. They made me pro bono lawyer of the year. They've, <coughs> they've given me the, the award for civility and professionality. They have put me in the <coughs> inn of court as a master for many, many years. And uh, God has a great sense of humor because oh, 13 or 14 years ago I was sitting in the barber chair. My cell phone rang, and it was the president of the state bar. And he said, Don, we've got an opening on the ethics committee. <laughs> and I spent 10 years on the ethics committee in what they call the ethics hotline in Kentucky. <laughs> Folks, thank you all so much. It's a joy to be here, and I love you all. Good night. <laughs>